I told you last week about Israel. God had good plans for them, didn't he? He planned to take them into the land of promise. But their mouths sent them in the wilderness for 40 years. In fact, he said to them, I'm going to do to you as I heard you say. And for the next 40 years, they wandered in the wilderness until they dropped down dead. That was not God's plan. Listen, God has some plans for your life this year. Did you know you can stop the plan of God in your life? Wow. That's kind of, that's kind of scary, isn't it? I can stop the plan of God in my life. Or I can help to facilitate his plan. Come on. I can help to bring about the purposes. God, God says, I got good things in store for you. Amen. I'm going to step into that. See, I, can, I, I have a responsibility in this now. And I want to show you this this morning. I've got some things I want to speak to you. And I want to start here in Job chapter 38. We don't often go to Job for the, at all, but we're going to go there for a minute. Job chapter 38, there's, you know, the story of Job. And this is the, the part of the story where God's having a conversation with Job. You know, he asked him if he, Job, you know, you know where I keep all the storehouses of ice and snow and all that stuff that when it's time to send it to North Carolina, do you know where I keep all that stuff? And you, he starts asking him all these, all these fabulous questions that Job's got no answers for. And look what he says in Job 38, verse 33. He says, do you know the laws of heaven? Do you know there's laws in heaven? Yep. Just like there's laws on earth, there's laws in heaven. He says, do you know the laws of heaven? Can you impose its authority on the earth? Or I think in the living Bible, it says, do you know the laws of the universe? and how the heavens influence the earth. See, did you know God, when he set up this world, he put some laws into effect. Before he ever created, created the world, he already had laws that he established. And one of them, you could just look at the natural laws. We look at something like gravity. If we weren't for gravity, we'd all be flying off into outer space, right? And God had to, before he could create people, he had to create gravity. So he created these laws that govern the universe, but did you know, he says do you, to Job, do you know the laws of heaven and how they influence the earth? The laws of heaven influence, see, listen, the laws of heaven are greater than the laws of earth. You know, you, you've got, even in the natural, you see it, if you're, if you're speeding down the highway, do you know they have speed limits on the highway? I ask that because some of you, I think, don't know. There are speed limits on the highway. And if you're speeding down the highway and you see those flashing lights behind you, what's going to happen? You're going to get a ticket. It's the law. You could say, I didn't know there was a speed limit. Too bad. You are still subject to the law. I didn't know it was only 75 miles an hour zone. I thought it was 105. Too bad. You still get a ticket. Now, listen, if you're speeding down the highway, but now instead of driving your car, you're driving an ambulance. And now the police see you. Now you might get a police escort. What's the difference? There's different laws that govern how that works. Well, am I still breaking the law? You're breaking the speed limit, but now the law allows you to drive that particular speed, I suppose. The, th the point is, there's laws, but then there's laws that supersede laws. You're living under a different law. So God asked Job, he says, do you know the laws of heaven and how they influence the earth? The, gravity is a law, but if you get in an airplane, is there still gravity? Does, does gravity still work? It still works, but once that airplane starts hitting a certain speed, the law of gravity is superseded by a greater law. The law of lift allows that plane to take off. It, al it's, it allows it to supersede gravity for that time. As long as it's going that certain speed, it'll stay up in the air and it will supersede gravity. Now listen, see, I want you to catch something because this is important. In your life, there are laws that influence your life, the laws of heaven. Let's, let's say it this way. God put laws in the world and his spiritual laws supersede natural laws. 
Let me give you an example. A man cannot walk on water. Right? Try it. Man can't walk on, but Jesus was operating under a higher law. The spiritual law superseded the natural law. Man cannot feed 5,000 people with a boy's lunch. There's natural laws that say that that gets impossible, but Jesus was operating under a higher law. Are you with me? The natural is subject to the spiritual. That was deep. The natural is always subject to the, to the spirit. Because, and I'll get into this in a minute, because the world was created by the spiritual force of God. In fact, he says the things that exist were made from things that can't be seen. The natural was made from the supernatural. The natural came out of the supernatural. Therefore, the natural is subject to the supernatural. So you, he asked Job, do you know the laws of heaven? Because the laws of heaven influence the earth. See, nature says your body is going to wear out. But now there's a different law. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Nature says dead things don't come to life. But there's a greater law. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. You see, there's a greater law at work. There's a greater law at work in your life, and it's the law of the Spirit. And I want to talk about some of these things because we've been talking about some different laws. We, we spent a long time, uh, a long time ago, we spent some time on the law of sowing and reaping. And then we spent some time on that spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And now I want to get you into this law of confession because your confession, your mouth is how things get done on this earth. God gave you, listen, we, we're going to get into this now. It's going to get deep, okay? God gave you spiritual authority on this earth to speak some things. And we need to be people who speak. We're going to, I'm going to explain this, okay? I took some time with it last week. So if you missed last week, you need to go back and listen because it's going to build today a little bit deeper, okay? Go to he, Hebrews chapter 3. And I want to start here. Hebrews chapter 3, at verse 1, he says, Therefore, holy brothers and companions in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So he calls Jesus the apostle and the high priest of our confession. So what is a confession? What does that word mean? The word, the, the word literally means, to, it's, it's a Greek word that you don't care about, but it means to say the same thing as another person. You know, you, my kids get on each other's nerves sometimes when doing this. Somebody says something, the other one copies them. They're, I don't know if your kids do that. My, my kids purposely try to get on each other's nerves. And all day long, I got to say, stop bothering your sister. Stop bothering your sister. Usually, it's, it's, that's how it goes. The brothers annoy the sisters. Stop it. Stop it. But they're copying each other. But this is what that word means, is to say the same thing as somebody else. So what are you supposed to be saying? The same things that God says. What should I be saying about me? The same things that God says. You should not look in the mirror and say, oh, you're so ugly. That's not what God says about you. You are created in the image of God. You can stand there and say, oh, you're beautiful. Look at that bald, beautiful head. It's so beautiful. <laughs> you, you were created in the image of God. So I got I to gotta learn how to speak like God speaks about me. I got to learn how to speak like God speaks about my family. I got to learn how to speak like God speaks about other people and about the things in my life. I got to learn how to talk like he talks because he is the high priest of my confession. If I've got a bad confession, he's got nothing to priest over. I got to give him something to, to say. I got to be saying what he says. So he's the high priest of our confession. Look at this now. You're in Hebrews. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3. And you know this, Hebrews 11, the faith chapter. And he says in verse 3, by faith we understand 
Listen, you can understand some things by faith. Things in the word of God, you, you can only understand them by faith. Sometimes people try to figure out this word with their logical brains. It's not, a, it's not a logical book. It's a faith book. So he says, by faith, we understand some things. We understand the universe was created, how? At God's command. So that what is seen has been made from things that are not seen or that are not visible. Everything we can see, everything we can touch was made from the invisible. You know, science likes to look at how small can things get. They, got, they, they used to be, I remember in school, they taught us the atom was the smallest thing. Now I hear there's things that are smaller. There's some, kind of, there's some kind of quantum particles or something. They don't even really, I don't think, understand what they are. At least I don't understand what they are. But there's, there's things that are underneath the things that are underneath the thing. And, and they, it's, but listen, everything that is was made from what you can't see. It was made from God. Everything in this natural world came from a word. Think about that for a minute. Everything you can see came out of a word. God spoke a word and trees grew out of nothing. There was no seed. He just spoke the word and trees appeared. And now we take those trees and you're sitting on pews made of wood. You're sitting on something that came out of the word. You, now listen, he spoke and the, the ground was formed, but he formed you. Oh man, he formed man, didn't he? But everything you can see was made of what you can't see. So listen, the things in this world are subject to the word of God. Your, your life, everything in your life is subject to this word because it came from the word. It knows where it came from. It remembers where it came from. You got to learn how to speak the word. Listen, a mountain does not have any ears. But Pastor Kim told us that if you say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, it should listen to you. How does it listen with no ears? Because it responds to the word of God. A fig tree does not have any ears. But Jesus spoke to one. You need to talk to some things now. Come on, get in your car. You talk, be nice to that thing. You better talk nice to that thing or you'll kill it. Some of you have been having trouble because you've been speaking the wrong things. Quit cursing stuff. Start speaking blessing. Listen, a storm doesn't have any ears. But what did Jesus do? Hey, storm, peace be still. He spoke to the storm. And the storm listened and obeyed because it responds. Everything in this world will respond to the word of God. So we got to get talking to some things now. Is there some things in your life you need to get talking to? Is there some things in your family you need to get talking to? See, sometimes things have gone wrong because we haven't learned how to speak the word, how to, how to confess the word of God over things. And that's been our problem. We've been like Israel Israel sent in those spies, right? And they got in there and they came back and they said, we can't do it. And those people complained and said, why? We should have just died in the desert. Why did God do this to us? And it, and it said that that word that they spoke against God was called slander. They slandered God because they did not believe what he said. When you don't believe what God said about you, when you don't believe what God says about your situation, you're slandering God. But when you come into agreement with what he says and you say, you know what? I, I know how I feel. I don't feel right. I don't feel good. I don't feel like this is a good, I don't, I don't, I know what I can see. And I know in, in the natural, I can see this, but I know what God said. And I start speaking what God said over my situation. That's what I got to get into. I got to get into his confession, not just continue to say the wrong things. Are you with me? I believe this, you will always get what you say. You will always get what you say. So if you, if you wake up in the morning and you say, oh man, I, this is gonna be just such a terrible day. Oh, isn't, that, isn't this gonna be all? Guess what you're gonna have? If you get up, you start looking at your checkbook, you say, I'm just always gonna be sure I'm never gonna get ahead. Guess what you're gonna get? How can God bless you when you don't believe his word? 
How can he bless you when you won't declare the Lord said he's my provider and I'm going to trust that. You get up and you say, I guess, I guess the doctor was right. I'm just... It's just, I'm just going to be as sick as a dog. And, you know, no, guess what you're going to get? I, instead, I want to, you know, I can say this. People accuse this kind of talk of being, of being uh, just denial. You're just denying the facts. No, no, no. Listen, when David faced Goliath, he did not deny there was a giant in front of him. He didn't say, oh, I don't even see a giant here. I don't believe that you're really a giant. I think you're really a short man in disguise. He did not deny it was Goliath that he was a giant. But you know what he did? He refused to talk about how big he was. I don't see in the Bible anywhere where David says, oh, Goliath was really scary. He was so big. He was just, he doesn't talk about it. You know what he talks about? He talks about what he's going to do to him. Right? Joshua and Caleb went in with those other 10 spies they came back. They didn't deny there was giants. No, no, they're lying. There's no giants. No, they didn't deny it. But what they, the, the reality they chose to accept was the fact that God was greater than the giants. What you got to get a hold of is you might, listen, you might be going through something today. You might be facing something in your life today. I'm not telling you to deny that those things exist. But what I'm telling you is to say, in spite of those things, God's word is true. Come on and speak the word of God. Things you got to go in the name of Jesus. Body, you got to get better. You know, whatever it might be, you start speaking to those things like God speaks. Whew, I need to take a pause for a second, catch my breath. You guys get me worked up in here. Come on. See, listen, Israel started speaking what they could see. They started speaking, instead of faith, they started speaking fear. And I think that's a lot of people's problem today, isn't it? Instead of speaking what God says, they speak out of fear. Oh, I'm, just, I'm just afraid such and such is going to happen. I'm just afraid. Uh, I don't even want to. You know what I mean? They, just get, they let fear talk. Listen, fear will speak just like faith will speak. Fear, I, and I, I believe this, fear is a spirit. Fear is a spirit and will come and whisper to you. I've heard it. I've heard, out of the blue, out of nowhere, you hear, what kind of thought was that? You start hearing these things. Don't let fear speak, because that spirit wants to speak through you. Listen, I'm talking to spiritual people today. The spirit of fear wants to speak through you. And what happens when you start declaring what fear says? You give the spirit a voice. Instead, you need to give the word of God voice in your life. Don't you give fear an inch. You with me? I, I remember, I've mentioned this story maybe before, but I remember when my son, Bram, he was about two years old-ish, and he was upstairs playing with his siblings, and I don't exactly know how it happened, but I know he put his thumb into the backside of a door by the hinges, and the door was slammed shut, and his thumb was still barely attached to his hand, and I took him to the doctor, and it was just a, just a bloody mess. I'm sorry, it's so gross, but it was just, I was just trying to keep it, his thumb on there and keep him from playing with it. And, and um, I thought, oh, he's going to have to be a shop teacher, you know? These thoughts start coming in my head. And I, I, I thought, oh, no. You know, in, in your head, you start hearing, you start hearing these voices. Fear, fear says, that thing's coming off. There's no way, you know what I mean? Fear will start talking to you like that. That's impossible. Look at, look at this. Fear wants you to speak. I refuse. Now listen, has, I'm not telling you I'm perfect. There's been so many times in my life where I maybe have messed up. But in this moment, I knew from the Lord, I got to only speak what God is speaking. So I said, I said you're fine, boy. You're going to be fine. His mom was getting upset. I said, no, no, he's going to be fine. We took him to the doctor. You know, because in your head, you think, he's going to lose this. I took him to the doctor. The nurse looked at it. She said, oh, that looks bad. I, he might lose that. I said, no, he's going to be just fine. Thank you. They're going to stitch it right back on. No problem. Took him in. The doctor looked at it. He said, oh, that looks bad. I said, it's fine. It's just stitch it up. It's fine. He said, he said we can, I can stitch that. I can stitch it up. He stitched that thing back on. And he did a great job. The Lord was working through that, man. And he looked at it. He said, that, that thumbnail's, 
he's never going to have a thumbnail on that thumb. I said, yes, he is. It's going to be just fine. He'll, have, he'll be able to scratch just like everybody else. <laughs> and and uh, we went home. They gave us some paperwork. We went home. That thumbnail never came off. I took him back in to get the stitches out, and the nurse said, what did the orthopedic say? I said, what? They said, you, you, this says, this gave you some paperwork that you're supposed to take him to an orthopedic. I said, I didn't read the paperwork. <laughs> I got the thumbs, the thumb was back on. She said, no, 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 there, there was some, that was serious. There was some, could have been some damage to the bone. The doctor was concerned that the thumb could still fall off or whatever was going to happen. There was going to be some problem with the bone. I said, fine, I'll take him to the orthopedic, but he'll be fine. He'll be fine. I took him in there and the orthopedic, I promise you, he x-rayed that thing. He came back in. He said, why are you here? I said that they told me at the emergency room, I had to come in here. He said, there's nothing wrong with that. I can't even see where there was anything that happened to it. There's no damage to anything. Listen, in the natural, you want to start talking out of fear. In the natural, and it's, and it's natural, but you are not natural. You got to start talking like God talks. Don't give fear any place in your life. He says this back in Job, again, if you could put up verse uh, chapter 3, verse 25, he says in, in the King James, for the thing, you know, all this stuff happened to Job, all these bad situations, all the things, his children died, all this. He said, for the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was afraid of is come to me. What did Job greatly fear? I can tell you because he said it. In chapter one, you see he's making sacrifices every day for his children because he's afraid that one of them has spoken against God and that God's going to destroy them. He was greatly afraid for his children. Is that natural to be afraid for your children? Yes, it is. As a, before I had kids, I didn't think I would be afraid of anything. And then I had kids. I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to hurt themselves and this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And you start getting this fear that wants to come on you. And maybe there's something else that you're going through a situation. You thought, oh, I'm not afraid of anything. And then something comes against you and you think, oh man, maybe a some kind of illness or sickness or some kind of financial crisis or something comes on. And then suddenly you're, you, you're anxious and you thought, man, I didn't ever think I'd be anxious about anything. But now you're, you're afraid and you're anxious and all this stuff is building and building and building. Listen to me. You have to learn how to speak the word of God in the face of fear. That's the only way it's going to leave because as soon as you give him a voice, he knows he can stay. You've given him permission to stay. But you got to learn how to speak the word of God. It's dangerous to talk about fear. And I'm going to give you a couple of scriptures here real quick. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 2. Solomon says this, you've been trapped by the words of your lips. Ensnared by the words of your mouth. Look at Psalm 39, verse 1. I said, I will guard my way so that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth with a muzzle as long as the wicked are in my presence. You get what he's saying? I don't want to say anything. If the enemy's standing there listening, I don't want to give him any ammunition. I don't want to give him anything he can use. I don't want to give fear an inch. I'm going to, in fact, he says this, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 32. If you've done foolishly in lifting up yourself or you've thought evil, Put your hand over your mouth. Some of you, that's good advice. That's good advice for me. If you get thinking the wrong things, if you start thinking about something contrary to the word, put your hand over your mouth. I'd rather walk around like this all day than say the wrong thing. Get your mouth in check. Some people find themselves in the same patterns over and over and over because they won't learn how to keep hold of their mouth. Are you still with me? Go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5, and this is the Passion Translation. He says this, before he finished speaking, people arrived from Jairus' house. They pushed through the crowd to give Jairus the news, there's no need to trouble the master any longer, your daughter's died. You know the story. Jairus had come to Jesus. Jesus, please come heal my daughter. She's sick. She's on death's door. Please come. And they come to him and they say, don't trouble Jesus anymore. She's dead. 
What do you do with that? The thing that, that I greatly feared has come upon me. What do you do with that? Listen to what Jesus says here. It says, Jesus refused to listen to what they were told. And he said to the official, don't yield to fear. All you need to do is keep on believing. See, when you begin to speak fear, you're yielding to that fear. When you begin to speak things that are contrary to the word, you're yielding to another spirit. Don't yield to any other spirit. You speak the word of God. You speak the word of God only. See, listen, people can say it's not realistic. No, we're just, we're just giving God greater authority than anything we're going through. You still with me? I want to show you how God speaks for a minute. I want to show you at Romans, I opened this with this scripture, Romans chapter four. And this is how God speaks. And this is how we need to be because he, he tells us to be imitators of God. Just like children imitate their parents, be imitators of God because he's your father. So that means you need to act like him. So look at what he says in Romans chapter four. In verse 16, he says, the promise is by faith. So it might be according to grace to guarantee it to his descendants. He's talking about Abraham. He starts talking about Abraham and he says in God, he says he's the father of us all in God's sight. In verse 17, it's written, I have made you the father of many nations. And then it says, he believed God who gives life to the dead and calls things into existence that do not exist. This is how God speaks. This is how God spoke to Abraham. Abraham had a name, exalted father, Abram. In fact, what it really was referring to was his father. He was exalting his own father because that's the name his father gave him. But God gave him a new name. He said, you're no longer exalting your own father. Now you're a father of multitudes. And so Abraham's name is now father. And so he has to introduce himself over and over and over to people as a father of multitudes. How many kids do you have? Father of multitudes? None. But you see how God speaks. It says he calls things into existence that do not exist. Or in the King James, he calls things that be not as though they are. You ever have a dog that just won't come when you call it? I, I think every dog we've ever had. I guess I'm bad with dogs. But we had, a, we had this dog. I would, I would call this dog and call this dog. This dog, would it refused to listen to me because, you know what, it liked to go visit all the neighbors. All the neighbors would give it treats and stuff. And in fact, sometimes I'll be walking the dog and they, the people would come out, oh, hi, hi, Aspen, they'd yell to the dog. They didn't, I'd never met them before. People I've never met, but they knew my dog because she would go visit everybody, but did not come when I called her. Acted like she didn't know me. <laughs> Terrible. But when God calls something, even if it doesn't exist, it comes. So when he said, come on, light, there's, there's, no, there's no such thing as light, but he called it and it came into the natural world. When he said, when he said, um, whatever he said, the plants and all the things, things that didn't exist came. He spoke the word and fish are swimming through water. He spoke the word and birds are flying through the air. Things that didn't exist suddenly came into existence just because he spoke the word. He calls things that be not as though they are because when he calls them, they come. And then he says, now you act like me. God calls things that are not like they are. So here's our problem. We call things like we see them. We're, we're just not seeing right. Stop calling things like you see them and call them like they're supposed to be. Call them like the word says they are. Come on. I might not have enough right now, but I know this word says he provides for all my needs. I've never seen the righteous forsaken. That's what I'm going to declare. 
You might be going through something in your family. You get this word. Listen, here's what we need to do. We need to find the promises because this word is full of promises. We got to find the promises of God and begin to speak them over our lives. We've got to begin to speak his word. Don't just speak what you want. You speak what the word says. Are you with me? Don't just speak what you think is good. Because sometimes what you think is good is not good. It's just what you think is good. You need to learn how to speak the word only over your life, over your family, over, I'm telling like over your kids. I'm speaking from experience. We got to speak the word over those rascals. Come on. He goes on with this. Look at verse 18. He says, Abraham believed, hoping against hope, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what had been spoken. So you, will your descendants be? He can, now listen to this. He considered his own body to be already dead. In fact, I like the way it words it in the King James. He considered not his own body. That was basically already dead. He was 100 years old. Abraham believed the promise without considering himself. Abraham believed the word of God without considering his situation. Abraham believed the word of God and he didn't consider anything else. See, this is our problem sometimes. We get considering all the, all the issues. Well, God said this, but I, let, me, let me really think about it. You, we get in trouble up here instead of just saying what this says and believing it. Abraham didn't consider his own body, even though it was already dead, and even, or Sarah's womb, the fact that she was old too, without weakening in faith. He did not waver in unbelief at God's promises, but he was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God because, listen to this, he was fully convinced that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Stand up with me. Abraham was fully convinced. You got to be fully convinced that this word is for you. You got to be fully convinced that the word of God has the supreme authority in your life. You got to be fully convinced that what God spoke to you, he's able to do. Do you believe God's able? Do you believe his word today? Listen, if he, if you've got the word, You've got the most powerful thing in the universe because this whole universe came out of the word. God spoke the word and the world was. God spoke the word and things came to be. So listen, you gotta start speaking the word over your life. Speak the word of God today. I wanna ask you just to bow your heads for a moment. Maybe you're going through something today, whether it's a some, some kind of, addiction or a thing that you can't shake, or maybe it's just a, a situation in your family or a, or a financial crisis or whatever it might be, a sickness, an illness, you're going through something today. You've got the word. You've got all you need. All you need is the word. Maybe you're here today. And you say, I don't, I've, I've never given my life to Jesus. That's where you start. Because this word won't work for you unless you're submitted to him. That's where you start. How do, I, how do I give my life to Jesus? The word of God says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God's raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. You don't get saved without confessing. You don't get saved without believing. But you got to confess the word today. If you need to do that right now, I want you to pray that with me. Or if you're watching online and you say, I need to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior, I want you to confess that right now, Lord. I thank you that you are my Savior. Say that with me. Thank you, Jesus, that you are my Savior. Thank you that you came to this earth and died for me. I believe you are the Son of God. And that you gave your life to save mine. I give you myself today, Jesus. Amen. Listen, when you confess that he's your savior, he'll save you. 
but you need to make you, make him your savior. Now listen today, maybe you need to confess the word over some other situation in your life. Maybe there's something going on in your family situation, your body, all these things that I mentioned. I want you today, do you just speak the word? Lord, I thank you today for giving each person the word to speak. If you're not sure what word to speak, you ask the Lord, he'll show you. Some words I've been speaking over my life is that my youth is renewed like the eagles, that he has restored my soul, that goodness and mercy are following me all the days of my life. The favor of God's on me. That's some of the things I'm speaking over my life every day. You need to speak the word of God over your life. You need to speak the word. When you're at work and something's going on, you just speak the word. You go home today and there's something happening in your home. You just, you just speak the word. You go to the doctor tomorrow and you hear a report. You just speak the word. Because his word is greater than any thing you can face in this life. So Lord, we thank you today for your word. Lord, I thank you today for your goodness and your love towards us and the word that you've given to us. And Lord, we thank you that we are overcomers because of what you've done for us, because of the word that you've given us. Lord, I thank you that your word will be in our hearts, your word will be in our mouths, that we won't be like Israel who couldn't enter into the promise because they would not believe the word. But Lord, we're standing upon your word because your word is truth. Your words are spirit and your words are life. I thank you, Lord, for blessing each person today in the name of Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed that. Hope it ministered to your spirit today. And uh, let me tell you, if you want to see more videos from us, be sure to hit the like button or the subscribe button. And uh, also, we're live every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Hope that you can join us. Hey, keep living the abundant life that Jesus called you to live. God bless.